Hello, and welcome to an EAS Consulting Group webinar. Today's topic is reassessment of environmental monitoring programs presented by Dr. Russell Guaberic. Dr. Guaberic has over 25 years of food safety experience in a broad range of human, infant formula, and pet food industries. She received her MS and PhD in food science from the University of Georgia and has developed and conducted customized training in HACCP, sanitation, environmental monitoring programs, micro laboratory methods, ingredient product specifications, and designing challenge and process validation studies. This, this webinar will be recorded and we will open the webinar to Q&A as time allows following the presentation. If we aren't able to address your question during the Q&A, our team will follow up with you directly by email. All right, Russell, if you'd like to go ahead, I will also be kicking off a poll. If everybody would please take a moment to complete that. Good. A majority of you have established, established your environmental more than five years ago. But for those that are fairly new, I think there's uh, some things to learn from this webinar. And I start off with saying, I can't move my screen, Jessica. Can you move the slide next? I I don't believe so. Give it a try now. Um, it may have been the link you'd clicked on. There we go. So almost everybody, if you are with a, a food, food established facility, will already have established some form of an environmental monitoring program. Uh, many of you have, as we see in the poll, over five years, but is it time, if you haven't reassessed, is it time to reassess your programs? Uh, the program comes in different names, Pathogen Environmental Monitoring Program, Environmental Monitoring Program for Pathogen Control. But ultimately, the primary objective of the program is to find and eliminate the pathogen before it contaminates the product. And I know it's a resource at the plant that uh, we can constantly battle in food facilities because if we find a problem, it increases the cost and would could 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 uh, uh, affect your budget budget. So I pulled together for for both agencies FSIS and uh, FDA. I pulled together recent recalls. As you can see. We still continue to do to experience or uh, ex uh, recalls of ready to eat products, but I wanted to highlight to you some of the things in this recall. They are not all FSI re recalls are not all pathogens. So just to plant the seed in your mind on some of the things that we will be discussing in this webinar, is you see, I look into when I see a recall, what caused the recall. If there's a foreign material issue that can impact the equipment, it may you may have to review and consider how you would clean it if the equipment interior of the equipment is damaged. Now, many of uh, many of the recalls of FDA FDA regulated product are mostly pathogens. There's one on wood fragments. So the question would be, how would wood fragment enter into the product stream? Now, wood fragments, as you know, is an adsorbent material. It can carry pathogens. Uh, in my experience in the past, I have a uh, washing, a, wa uh, a supplier of, of um, reused pallets where they have five years worth of um, data that there were no pathogens because they were swabbing. So a mere sim uh, simply changing the procedure instead of swabbing, but taking the pieces of wood, I found salmonella, E. coli, listeria, and salmonella. 
So there's a risk of foreign materials getting into our product. More so, the current regulations or, or mandate is really targeted towards ready to eat. But it's not it's not just ready to eat. You need we need to avoid uh, contaminating from the environment into our product. So let me go back from where we begin. We've experienced, still continue to experience recalls in the past year or so for pathogens. But if you recall the 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 beginning, as I would say, of environmental money program, programs really started after the Bill Maher outbreak. In 1999, Bruce Tompkin and others, uh, industry experts, had um, published a paper where, and they identified the common sites for listeria contamination. So I want to point out the fact it, in 1999, it's already been established that there are sites in the equipment. If you look at these sites, more often they are zone one and probably zone two. But what do we see in our current environmental programs? When I audit the plants, I see more on the environmental programs, the list of sites are zones three and four. Is that really truly where we should be looking for? True that zones three and four could be vectors and they are a result of transient contamination, but it's truly the zone one areas that really would impact greatly the safety of the product. Now we are a little bit risk averse of testing finished food or product contact surfaces for pathogens, but FSIRS regulation mandates that in certain cases you have to do zone one. So back in 20, from 1999, there's a lot of uh, trainings done on, on control of the steering in the environment. Uh, if I remember correctly at that time, it was also the beginning of looking into salmonella as potential environmental contaminant. Uh, I had co de developed a course on salmonella control in the environment with Dr. Silliger prior to the issuance of the uh, GMA control of salmonella in moisture food, foods. In there, the summary essentially, I would say moisture control is critically important in preventing salmonella. True, you may find there may be an ingress somewhere, but in my experience, salmonella contamination most likely could be coming from an area interior of the equipment. And I'll walk you through that later. Now in 2014, the FSIS compliance guide was issued and then there's a recognition that for certain uh, um, products that fall under different uh, alternatives, there'll be a zone one recommendation of a zone one product contact testing. But we we don't see this in the FDA uh, regulated products. So in 2015, we have FISMA and there is the beginning of the recognition that environmental monitoring for an environmental pathogen or indicator is important in ready to eat foods. So mine, I want to reiterate for both FSIS and FDA, focus us on ready to eat. Now, I'm not saying that we don't do environmental and not ready to eat. We assess the risk. So, but bottom line is, regardless of which um, guideline you, you uh, use, there's cer certain things that we need to follow. First, Establish written procedures, and the question is, is it scientifically valid? Now, in the FSIS USDA world, they justify uh, for each zone or for each location you identify for your sampling, what is the justification? But for many that out that have provided recommendations, even for a specific industry recommendation, it will always call it do a risk assessment. 
Unfortunately, this is kind of where things most likely could get lost in how would somebody conduct a risk assessment of the equipment on the process and the product. And I'll walk through some examples of that. And then there's a question is which organism? The more sites you have, the more organisms, the more it would cost the company and would affect your bottom line for your budget. But these are all consistently, you see this in all recommendations, timing and frequency, test conducted, method use, the laboratory. And I'm not gonna go through uh, the last three bullet points uh, because of limited time. But I wanted to highlight to you that when FDA collects some, some samples in your facility, it'll be largely taken from zone one. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't typically test zone one for pathogen unless directed by a regulatory mandate or a customer requires it. They, they take samples to a lesser extent zone three, but I want to highlight the fact that in the FDA recommendation, sampling is not generally taken on zone four areas. But what do we see in location sampling sites for many of the environmental programs? It's basically targeting zone three and four. Now for Listeria, they take 60 swabs for Salmonella 100 swabs. But I wanted to point out to you that if you, if the organism you target is Listeria, the approach could be different than when your organism of concern is Salmonella. So you will see the investigate in the of investigations operations manual, the recommendations of where you would most likely find find Listeria. So they have recommendations on where to, to collect. Now, some of these are zone three, but if you notice, so many of these are equipment. Many are in zones two. And I wanted to highlight, because to me, this is critical for where if you were to define a fixed site, it will be under the floor. So you will alert you of a risk of potentially your product being contaminated if you find it on a floor that is not on uh, uh, a full traffic area or an equipment traffic area. So right now I'm anxiously waiting for when the, the FDA will issue the, the sanitation control. And I'm hoping that before it comes out, they would consider one thing because sanitation is not just cleaning. You can't clean an area on an equipment if you don't consider the sanitary design or the preventive maintenance schedule of that equipment. Again, I want to reiterate it. Sanitation control is not that cleaning and sanitizing, but you can't clean if you don't know what the design of the equipment or any ancillary equip, uh, uh, equipment. One thing to note though, the recommendation of sampling the frequency is, if you look at the FDA, uh, F the FSIS compliance guide, it'll be three hours into production. FDA, uh, the Investigations Operations Manual or IOM says at least four hours. But that three or four hours really goes back. If I remember correctly in my days when I was teaching environmental monitoring, it really goes back to a study that was done wherein the pathogen will, not, will make its way out of the equipment and you will find it three hours or four hours on the production. So the question comes is, if we're testing zone three, do we really need to continue three or four hours? Because as you can see, in certain industries, things are really get busy. 
three or four hours is really to see if an equipment, if there's something in the equipment that can contaminate the product, that it will make its way out of the equipment. Now, everybody is talking about when you go to any uh, environmental co course or any talk, you will hear the word seek and destroy. But I would say that it's not always feasible. You seek and you, and you find, and there are some challenges that uh, uh, manufacturing plants, plants, plants face. So yes, we would like to see it destroyed or eliminate if you find it. But then to me, when I look at a program, if I see that there are recurring positives in the same location or in proximity to each other, is it truly, have you done really uh, a mitigation on the pathogen? When do you, you don't have any findings, so is it time to reassess where you would shift your um, locations so you would find it if it's there? But ultimately, what you don't want to happen if you don't, you have negative, you don't have any findings in your EMP program, and then you have a positive in your finished product. So this is something that I would like to propose a, a, an additional concept of the seek and destroy, but it's uh, guess it's not always the destruction of the pathogens. We may have to consider managing it based on where the location is, because it may require that you have to retrofit or you have to change the configuration of the equipment, the equipment and that requires time, that requires investment capital. So to me, the question would be, if you were to assess your environmental monitoring plan, what is your budget? Based on your budget, of course, you budget for what? you need to make sure that the, your product that you produce is safe. But before we start, we have to look at how much do I spend on Listeria? How much do I spend on Salmonella? To me, I'd like to take us back to really understanding what the organisms are, what the pathogens are. There are some industries or food where the recognized pathogen of concern is only listeria. So you need, if you're looking for listeria, you need to understand what is the characteristic of the organism. So the one thing in sanitation that they will say, oh, we have this sanitizer and it will break biofilms. But we have to recognize that biofilms form because we are unable to clean an equipment. There are areas in an equipment that's difficult to clean. So should we be targeting for those areas when we're doing cleaning? Or are we identifying that areas? So it may be that it will be the decision by the food safety team or the company, you test for indicators. That's okay, but we want to make sure that there are no niche areas because you don't want for a sanitizer to wait to apply sanitizer to disrupt or to, to destroy a niche. The other thing, if your organism of concern is salmonella, particularly in dry plants. So one thing to note, salmonella do not grow in refrig under refrigerated conditions. So if you are looking for a pathogen concern in a refrigerated area, should you be spending your resource on listeria rather than salmonella? One thing to note that it's known that salmonella can survive weeks in a dry environment. So the control for list salmonella is really different from listeria and I will maintain that the sites you look for listeria will be different from the sites, may likely be a different site than salmonella. So I'll use an example. So when you're establishing or reassessing your, your 
your uh, environmental program. What ask your question, what is the product you're making? What has been associated on the contamination on recalls, outbreaks of the product? So I'll use an example in the cheese manufacturing. If you're using pasteurized milk, you already have a kill step. So should we be focusing your resources in areas past pasteurization? But I'm not saying that you ignore the pasteurization step because this is the step in the process that will destroy. You have a validated time and temperature, but look at how the pasteurizer or even a heat exchanger is cleaned and sanitized. So I've encountered contamination coming from a crack plate heat exchanger. So it's the equipment. So currently, if you're doing zone one, you just swab floor here, floor there, under there. But look at the piece of equipment. You have the dome. How well is the dome clean? If you have a discharge pipe here, is the discharge, uh, is the valve a ball valve or a, a, it's a, a centri uh, uh, different type of ball, uh, valve? So you identify areas, but you look at and observe what the process is. Some air, some uh, programs I've seen they just swab the walls of the of the uh, uh, of the tank or a kettle, but to me, if you're heating the product, you have some form some way to eliminate if you it gets contaminated coming from the exterior of the tank. But what is critical? What is above the tank? What is Below the church and uh, the the uh, below the tank, and what are you adding? So if you know this, this is kind of a simplified version. But in any tank, you may see pallets being being uh, stored near the tank. So for cheese, listeria is the the pathogen of concern. So what is the what typically when you ripen the cheese, what is what condition what is the condition of the room? It is refrigerated. So more likely listeria can grow versus salmonella. Another example I have is the chocolate manufacturing process. If you're um, swabbing three, four hours into production, uh, it's underway and then you see pallets being uh, brought in. You see all activities. So I am proposing really identify sites underneath the equipment. But consider too that the more sites you have, you may not be able to, to sample that site in a year. Now, the last thing I have this picture is um, a dry environment. This is a typical uh, illustration of a spray drying process. These are all enclosed. Even if you swab, most likely contamination will already have been in the product, in the, inside the equipment before it manifests itself in the environment. Or if it's transient, it's coming from uh, the activities of for, the forklift, you may find it. But what is really important is contamination from within. So I was in a plant. This plant doesn't manufacture a, a product, a dry product that's embiquated in an outbreak. But I want to point out this cyclone piece. Do you think there would be a risk if the cyclone, the head of the cyclone is above the roof, extends beyond the roof? So the question to me, do we capture that in even in audits? If it's above the roof, there is a potential risk of salmonella of being uh, of con salmonella contamination coming from the roof. So what I'm saying here is we look at the product and we look at the process when we're establishing locations, because as I said, many of these 
we swab zone three, but then in outbreaks of butter, it's in the screw, con screw conveyor after pasteurization. It's the slicer when you're slicing. We already have known that as early as 1999. Salmonella and infant formula is the drying tower. So what is it in the drying tower that could harbor salmonella? You have to, you have to ask ourselves. So as I said, as question to ask as you establish or re reassess your EMP, what is the nature of that product? Is it dry? If it's dry, and you know in its form, it will not support growth. But if it's refrigerated, it's wet and it's liquid. If it it supports, it can support growth of of certain microorganisms. So ready to eat versus not ready to eat. So the regulations right now are really targeted to on ready to eat post lethality contamination. So when we when we when we audit the the process and equipment, the question to ask at the can the pathogen of concern grow? So we look for areas that could support growth. So when it, the product is dry, it will not grow. But there are areas interior the equipment, if it's not completely dry, could potentially allow the pathogen to grow. Now, if it's an RTE, not to say that you won't test it, uh, you don't have a program, but maybe in a scaled back version, then are ready to eat. The question for not ready to eat is, do you have a validated cook step? And if there is a high risk ingredient, and what is the level of contamination in that high risk ingredient? Not only ingredient. So in this next slide, I'm showing an example of a, uh, a uh, bar, a frozen bar, a specialty bar. Look at the handle. What is word? What is your specification for the um, the handle, the the popsicle bar? How do you maintain it? How do you clean it? Now, in any equipment, this is in a, in a cold environment, so most likely it will be more on listeria. But there are other post lethality added ingredient like chocolate that could potentially uh, harbor salmonella. As I mentioned, there are high risk ingredients, even if you're applying it uh, before a lethality, the microbial load of the ingredients uh, could pose a risk to the product. Now, this is the biggest piece is we need to look at what is the nature of the process. There is no one size fits all for the environmental side. Each plant will have to assess the risk based on the product and based on the process. I mentioned earlier pasteurization. There was a problem of the the uh, uh, the the pasteurizer, the, the, the plates of the pasteurizer was cracked. So even if it's recorded at rich temperature, you already have an ingress from a hot side to the cold side, cold or vice versa. You have the roasting. So even if your temperature shows it reached it reached its um, recommended validated process, how do you clean the roaster? Are you complete? Have you completely cleaned it and identified the areas? that most likely would accumulate some residues as you are roasting. And if you don't remove that at cleaning, that could be a potential area that would support growth. Frying, the same thing, although we say frying will kill, but what is post-frying conditions? Often, if you have a fryer, you have a hood. How do you clean the hood? How well is that clean? And chemical wash, as you know, there are different types of chemicals. If it's food contact, at best, you can have one at be, uh, to three log reduction. So if it's the, 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 the product 
or the ingredient is heavily soiled or contaminated, then that washing will not be effective to remove uh, contamination. But an example is produce. Blending. So it's dry. You keep it dry. But there are some things if I audit an e-blending process, what posts a risk to be blending is the vacuum system. How do you clean the vacuum? I was in a um, blending facility where the vacuum of six different blenders are connected to each other. So how you, can you clean, effectively clean a blender, effectively dry it, and to prevent contamination coming back down into the blending process? Drying. Drying, we say that um, for dried products, the organism of concern is salmonella. But I wanted to, to present to you freeze drying. It's a dry product. Typically, what you would think of is a salmonella is a concern. But if you truly understand the nature of the freeze drying process, it starts with a frozen material. What will most likely survive. An example would be, if you use an example for fruits, we had a recall at one point on salmonella in freeze-dried foods. And insert uh, and another example is Listeria. But in fruits, you cannot achieve a five log reduction in fruits without affecting the quality of the product. So typically it, it starts with a Free frozen material and they sublimate and then it turns dry. So depending upon the process, when I go out these facilities, there are specific areas in this process that if I were to go to a freeze dryer, I would target two areas in the freeze dryer. May not be for pathogens, but for indicators. Because when that Frozen material is dried, you have water. So in any of, any of the process, you really need to look for, identify where those areas are that water would accumulate and potentially product residues could accumulate as well. So as I said, we focus on prepackaged in environment and I'll bring you back to the concept. We have been talking about this. Everybody's talking about zone two, one, two, three, and four. But then, uh, except for FSIS, where there is a mandate, depending upon the alternative the product falls in, that you do product contact surfaces. We don't see that in the uh the uh, in the uh, FDA unless they are doing investigation and they focus on product contact. But many of the environmental programs I've seen really focus on zones three and four. So what can we do? The more sites we have, the more money it would cost and you most likely, you may miss something. But to me, focus on if you are targeting zone three, or perhaps some zone two, look at the transition point between zone three and zone four. What intervention have you put in place? So I was, um, I, I've come across a program where there, the bathroom in the hallway in the front office is always comes back positive for listeria. They clean, sanitize after three negatives, it passes, then they, they remove the location. But to me, what, what is the risk? The risk is people coming into the production floor. So is, it, is money well better spent on putting an inter intervention between zone three and four? So I will look at, I'm gonna shift uh, our, our, our discussion into the importance of evaluating the hygienic design of an equipment 
visual inspection before the start of production and during operations. We don't want to wait three or four hours into production and we find something. It's easy to look at a piece of equipment if you understand sanitary design, you know where those areas that could potentially harbor could, uh, uh, residues and if it's it gets contaminated or it gets wet and it doesn't get clean, it could become your harborage area or niche point. So for example, in any conveyor, you have a, 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 a guard, a chain guard. How often do you clean that chain guard? You may find that you have, you swab the area here and you find there is salmonella or Syria. But where is that coming from? Could that be coming from up here? It's possible if you don't clean it. Could it be coming from this area here, which is now close to the product? In the other, if you look at design, this area right here could potentially get missed during sanitation. So truly, in the, as I would say, in the, in the FSIS world, there is focus on pre-op inspection. And I don't know if that is also the case for most of the FDA regulated um, products. And then I also want to point out when you're washing, you have water coming into and you're using water. What about that pipe that water is coming from? You test for the sanitary, the, the potability of the water, but how often do you do that? You don't test the, the water every, every so often, and there are three, uh, or, uh, three, um, pipes there. But what about this let this pipe here where water is coming from? How often does that get clean? So to the right is I'm just gonna want to point out when you find if you're finding a pathogen in the area uh, on the floor during operation, try to find out if it is coming from your equipment. Is the equipment clean? Are there areas that get missed? An example, this is a produce operation. During production, observe where paddock accumulates. If you notice here, it's washed, it's chemically washed, but look at this uh, uh, electrical, um, uh, electrical um, wire here. Could that potentially be a harborage area? So it implicates, it could implicate the product if you're testing for a pathogen. But to me, visual inspection could tell you what you need to do, what you need to change, what you need to improve in your operations. Another thing, almond, uh, almond uh, the, the, this is almond processing, but look at the, the design of the equipment. There is a lip under that. So does that get cleaned? Even if the almond has been roasted, it could potentially be a uh, post-process contamination occur. Look at these chain guards here. How well are they clean? And this is one that is kind of, was quite a bit of a shock to me when I saw this. This is underneath a conveyor belt. So, how important is pre-op inspection? That uh, to me, that will be, that is the first thing that truly could direct you to where you need to be doing some testing. But if it's visually not clean and not properly clean, do you think it could become a hybridge area? It could become a, a niche, even if it's below the equipment it could find its way on the belt above this vibratory conveyor. So I can stress enough the importance of in visual inspection. The next slide is you see an, a, a clean room. It's well clean, 
But what happens during production? People come up and down. You have pallets up here being staged. So you have products being installed. And if you find it, you find it on the floor here. And then you just sanitize and clean the floor until you get three negatives. Would that truly serve its purpose to protecting the product? So if you see here, closer look on the equipment. So I wanted really to, to um, emphasize the importance of really understanding the equipment. Because if you are uh, cleaning, you see it's clean in the exterior, exterior. There are areas inside the equipment that you don't look. Any attachment, when you see this, what is the condition of the area between the the uh, uh, the inside this inside this, and not to say the one thing I would check, even if it passes AP, APC, if you uh, ATP, if you don't know where to look, any mixers, any blend blenders, dry blending. You have to look at the shaft and how well you clean the shaft. So when I go to a plant, when I ask, do you have an inspection mirror? When I'm told they don't have one, I carry one with me when I go to the plants just to show and tell. But if they don't have an inspection mirror, then how well can they perform a visual, uh, a visual inspection of recessed areas in an equipment. Another example, this is in a, a uh, spray drying facility. Just look at the design of the equipment, these clamps. How often do these clamps get removed? If I see evidence of, of product that's wet, that may have dried, to me, sanitation was not done effectively. Another thing, if you see a dead end. So typically in this situation, when I when I look for these areas, um, I prefer to evaluate the equipment after production, but before sanitation. And together with maintenance, I would in, uh, inspect and ask to remove. Now, you can always do this during normal production because um, time is of the essence. Operations wants to start production easy, uh, quickly, but then you need to make sure you assess every piece of that equipment, every area of the equipment to guide your, your quality uh, personnel in where to look for visual inspection. This is an example of a freeze drying of uh, uh, a, a spiral freezer. If you can see, it's kind of fairly clean, but I'm gonna highlight. There's an area here in the shaft on the shaft uh, of the spiral freezer that there's accumulation of product. Just seeing that is, is, is something that would need to be considered in the next sanitation cycle. Now, I'm not saying if you see residue that you test. You see residue, try to see how you can clean it better. Another piece that I would say, I was in a, a, a spiral freezer, and then it was like a Christmas tree. I, I would describe it as I enter. How many auditors see a spiral freezer when they audit? They can't because they're, it's already closed. So... If you are establishing, you need to look at what is there in your spiral freezer. The uptake belt in a spiral freezer, you have to assess the areas where you could possibly find residue. Another thing, you have curtains to protect the product during, during, uh, during production or during sanitation. But look at the condition of the tracks where the, where, where the curtain is. Could that be a harborage area? So it's not coming from below, it's coming from above. If it's close to a product contact area, then potentially contamination could occur. I'll also share with you rolling stock. We know it will, it, it can, 
but how many and the role is that you see in a dry environment, you don't see it clean. But I want to highlight the risk of the tires. If you find, I went to a plant when they say, oh, we know it's contaminated is coming from, it's in the tire, it's a dry plant. So what they do is they use boost or spray it with sanitizer, but you can't clean and you can clean a tire and continue sanitizing. Only you sanitize just the surface, not the crack. So as I said, I put in, in emphasis on visual inspection because that is our first line of defense. When we do some testing, budget is limited, but then we have tools. First, we use ATP, but if you do and truly identify the site, well, it makes, uh, ma makes most sense to your product. You could yet miss. An equipment may pass. It passed ATP. So I was in a plant where they said all their ATP passes, they were good. But two, three days later, they get an APC or a yeast count on the same surface. And it, the, the numbers are went to the roof. So how well, even if you swab and you have sanitized it, how effective is your sanitizer in eliminating the pathogen? ATP is not, I want to re re reiterate, it's not a re reliable predictor of contamination. And the functionality is depends on the make and model. I was at a plant where in the recommendation as you you, it's a fail, that was the setting of the luminometer. If it fails, if you have uh, a, a thousand RLU for stainless, and then 2,500 for um, um, plastic and 4,500 for rubber. So think about the rest. If you have a rubber uh, on your zone two, if the rubber cracks, no wonder after two to three days, they swab it and they find APC, high levels of APC and uh, levels of yeast. That tells you that you really need to assess, you need to establish the baseline based on your process and, on, uh, and the equipment. Now, once you find there are recurring sites of ATP failure, then that's where you need to look at what indicator organisms can I use, especially in zone one and zone two. And this is just an example. You have to establish the baseline based on your operations. There are suggested limits, but to me, if it's a wet cleaned area, it is conceivable that you will have a, you can achieve a less than 10 for APC. So again, you have to establish based on the product, the nature of operation, and how well you clean the equipment. But the bottom line I want to summarize is when looking for the area, the sampling locations, interior and exterior of the equipment, you need to look for the presence of water, the presence of moisture. If you're wet cleaning, water is everywhere. So how do you minimize? You try to, if there's a puddle of water, remove that water. One thing I want to emphasize is process water. There's a difference between the process and wa uh, water and potable water. Look for where there is condensate, where you have a hot um, a material and then you're cooling it based on the nature of the process, you could potentially have condensation. The one thing that is near and dear to me right now is compressed air. Imagine with the compressed air, how do we ensure that we have clean air coming in your compressed air lines? Vacuum systems. So what I'm going to propose here is for every process, you need to identify a fixed site. 
it doesn't always have to be swabs. It may be residues on the floor. One thing I learned from Dr. Silliger is when you're looking for contamination in a spray drying facility, you test for the material that's collected in the bag. The areas enter the equipment without foot or equipment traffic. The drains. One thing I want to mention, the drain. You swab the drain, we swab it three times to a negative, you clean the drain. But the question to us, what goes into that drain? So to me, if it's a drain, is a potential source primarily, as I would say, listeria, what flows into that drain? Look for accumulated product residues on the floor. So I can't overemphasize the importance of drain map. When I do an investigation, when I ask, do you have a drain map? And when they tell me none, how effective are your corrective actions? Because if you don't know where the water flows in, on, 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 in your facility, then you know that's one area that you may have missed where it's coming from. Look at this, there's some, some lines. You have one drain. So it's just looking at for water is dripping for one. And it, if it goes to a drain, look for where that water, what equipment, when you clean the equipment that it, it, will, it will flow from. Another example that I would say, you have an a, 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 a ingredient that is stored next to a drain. So what if you, your drain was positive? It's a zone three. But what implication will that be if you bring this pallet into the uh, near the uh, the mixer or uh, the uh, the mixing tank? You bring that up, and then is there a risk? Another thing I want to point out: cooling units. You see, in a in a cooler, you have spiral freezers, you have spiral coolers. There's a reason for this drip pan. It's similar to your refrigerators at home. Their water accumulates in this, could potentially accumulate under the pan. That's why you have a drain. Some companies put uh, some interventions like quad blocks, but if you don't clean, so to me, if you don't clean or put in a schedule of cleaning, you have water flowing down. Now, in one scenario I can share with you, I was in a bakery plant. Baker, bakery products, muffins, do not support the growth of pathogens. But they found listeria on a baked product. By, by mere just standing below this drain, and it's not, it's not the picture, but below this drain, a mist fell onto my face. And I found out that the cooling unit was defective and it's spewing moisture out of not the drain pan, but out of the fence. So I'm gonna shift into the air, the importance of air. There's process air and plant air. I learned this uh, in, in, a, in the, uh, the meeting for our Compressed Air uh, Institute that there is a difference. When we talk about plant air is what we, we establish a limit, but it's the processed air that really could, could cause contamination, could, could um, contamination on the finished product. So the recommendation is make sure that the air is clean, dry, and oil-free. So next time you go to the plant, look at your compressors, because you produce, the compressed air, you have a compressor. Look at what's underneath the compressor. How wet is that area? If people walk by there, that could potentially be a hybrid. I can't tell you how many compressors, compressor equipment that I've opened, that it's wet, damp, and slimy. The one thing, the question right now, there is, um, 
what is the micro standard of the process air compressed air? There seem to be still quite variability on how uh, uh, companies collect air samples. But there is ISO 8573 is kind of the closest, but there is no standard for microorganisms. The standard is for particles, water, and oil. So what is evident in a compressed airline? Right now, the hoses here are blue. So I cannot see what's in that hose. But if the hose is transparent, if the hose is already dark, that tells you that oil may have already passed through, potentially contaminating your finished product. So not only you don't clean these lines, but the question would be, how often do you replace these lines? Do you wait for your uh, gauge to tell you that there was a problem with the filter? Or you do establish that beforehand? Another is your CIP. Two things, example, I can tell you. A source of contamination was in the CIP tank. The return tank, it was came about in one of the operators told me, oh, there's product floating on the tank. So can you really effectively clean your system if your sanitize, uh, if your uh, wash tank, the return CIP tank is dirty? In an infant formula company, I recovered a um, a cleaning pad, the scrub pad on the lines. And of course, nobody has said that something fell there, but it was telling because the pressure of the water is starting to get low. It was blocking the flow of the cleaning solution. So I just want to share with you is uh, there is one thing uh, that is shared by the uh, hyg in, in hygienic food processing, what is uh, this uh, quality of water that you use in a CIP system. So I cannot reiterate the importance and I hope that when the issue of the sanitation control that I would really like to propose that environment preventive maintenance should become part of establishing your sanitation program. Because if you have a good maintenance program, it should be easier to clean the equipment. You don't wait till something breaks and now you will have challenged the sanitary condition of the equipment. So right now we seem to be chasing results of our environmental program based on your salmonella or listeria result. What I can share with you, corrective actions are not effective if recurring positives occur. I also came across, they do have a program, a facility head of program where you would say three negatives and then you stop. Three negatives, but where do you um, select, where do you uh, obtain your investigative sample? One plant basically showed me they drew a star on a passive side and they just cleaned that area. So any auditor, I would say, we need to consider if you're, if you have a hit, what they did do is more focused on what was done, what was the corrective action. Again, as I said, if it the same area reoccurs, or even in the vicinity of the area, corrective actions are not adequate. The positive side may not be a source. And this is what we have to consider what is our target organism? Is it Listeria? Is it Salmonella? Or is it wet or dry? 
If it's a wet operation, you can always clean and sanitize. But in a dry environment, you have to be judicious in applying water. So this may be something that we can influence to change. If you're in a dry environment, cleaning is not the first step. And this is something that I've learned from Dr. Silica himself. If you have a hip for salmonella, you take more swabs before applying your intervention. An intervention may not be wet cleaning. It may be controlled cleaning, but you really have to look at where the, org the source of organism is. So to me, right now, when you go to an environmental monitoring phase, they talk about corrective action. How do you do that? Root cause analysis, you do an inspection, but would it be better, sir, better for us to really begin the process even prior to establishing the locations and identify areas in an equipment or in the facility that can support the growth of organism? We have to remember that in salmonella, encrusted material, which would mean it's an indication that the material have been wet, and dry could fall into the product stream and you may not often see the contamination in the finished product. So rather than doing all these um, root cause analyses, should we do that ahead of time in trying to identify the location uh, that we would swap? So in conclusion, the collection of environmental samples should really require a thorough understanding of the critical factors, which would mean part of that is really where would product and moisture accumulate that will support growth of the pathogen. Within a process and for a specific product. So if you look at product and process and start thinking of how we would design or reassess the program. So to me, the first step is really to review your sanitation. Now sanitation is not just cleaning and sanitizing. So there are companies that will market the sanitizer is effective, but you have to clean the equipment. The equipment have to be visually clean. So identifying areas in an equipment that could harbor product and moisture is what we would need to consider to target when we're doing our verification. We have to consider, even if you have your ready sanitation operating procedure, but any change in the material, if you are a product, if you have a hygroscopic product, you've added a new product in your, in your, in your um, uh, line, is the equipment still, are you still able to clean the equipment in the same manner? So I'll show you an example, I'll share an example with you. In a spray drying facility, and this is in an infant formula industry, they have multiple spray dryers. These are industrial types of spray dryers. It alerted me that there is a problem with their airline because the operator told me that one dryer takes one and a half hours to dry and another three hours. What does that mean? To me, the drying process is not effective. So you don't have to do tests. If you look at the process, the last step before you bag, it goes to a, um, a uh, vibratory uh, conveyor. 
if you have a product, you expect a powder, and these are now clumps, you know there is water interior of the equipment. So only then we would say you do uh, pre-op inspection, post-sanitation, to ensure that it's visually clean. And when you find that there are areas that are difficult to clean, hard to reach areas, then you need to assess how well can I clean it? Or how often do I clean it? At the start, because it's real time, you may use ATP and you release, release production if ATP results are acceptable. But what if you have recurring failures on your ATP? Wouldn't it be um, judicious to evaluate if there is a risk in that area by doing micro testing for indicators? I'm not saying that indicators uh, indicators are a, could be a, a, a representative of a pathogen, but you're seeing growth of an indicator in an area interior of the equipment, most likely it can support the growth of pathogens as well. Now I'm saying repetitive ATP failure, often you take ATP before sanitation. But if your ATP failure occurs, the next time you may do APC, but then after the sanitation application of the sanitizer. Uh, I don't feel it's a good use for resources when you do ATP and APC at the time because you only test for ATP when you see it's visually clean. You verify and uh, verify that your ATP baseline is adequately set by doing some micro testing, indicator testing. So it's really ensuring it's not just the the pathogen may 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 have a vector from outside to inside equipment sanitizer air what have you but what we want to make sure that it doesn't get it, it doesn't get into the equipment that could potentially cause contamination on the product and to me it's something that we need to consider if there is a risk potential risk you may find you may uh, establishing a fixed site based on the product and the process may help determine the risk as quickly as possible So that concludes my presentation. I, I hope this will give you insights on what you need to do. An EAS can help you uh, reestablish your uh, program or re -ident identify those additional sites. And feel free to contact me and Tim Lombardo if you have additional question and may uh, or may uh, have some concerns uh, in in uh, on this presentation. Thank you very, everybody very much for joining us. We do have the Q&A open. If you'd like to ask any questions, uh, please feel free to do so now, or you can contact Rissell and Tim at their email addresses here. Um, we have received a few questions asking if the presentation will be available. We will not be providing the presentation handout for this webinar, but all registrants will receive access to the on-demand recording. Now, as I said, this is just a brief snapshot, but there's more specific, if uh, there's questions that you would like to ask specific to your product and process. And as I said, feel free to reach out to me and Tim so we can direct your question and possibly help you. But as I mentioned, the longer the list of locations that you swab. First of all, you could be spending more money on doing swabbing and yet you will not find it and not be able to protect your product. 
the key here I want to emphasize is looking at the programs even before you're doing the swabbing for pathogens and how well. Testing for pathogens can cost you more money than testing for indicators. You don't wait to find the pathogen in your product, nor do you want to what you don't want to wait till you have recurring uh, uh, presumptives or positives. I want to emphasize too that for listeria, many companies often tend to um, just test for listeria in the environment, species and indicator for listeria. But I would say, and this is something I've learned from Dr. Seliger, for salmonella, you really have to make sure you need to consider that you speciate it and you identify what salmonella speciate is so it can help you direct to where the source is. Because some of the strains have associations to uh, certain um, vectors. So are there any other questions, Jessica? We do have one question from Jonathan. He has a question on generic E. coli tolerance on food contact zone one. He says, I know Listeria SPP is zero tolerance, but is there anything for generic E. coli and coliforms? Uh, as far as I know for coliforms, there is none. You have to set the baseline. But if you have cleaned the equipment and sanitize it, like for example, via CIP line, you sanitize it, my expectation would be that you won't find coliforms. Now for generic E. coli, it depends on the product. Now we, will, we don't like to see generic E. coli in a food contact surfaces, in a food contact surface, but certain products do allow have certain levels, low level, like for example, for produce, you may find it. But the key thing, if you find it, if you, you the levels are high, then you need to address it. So for generic E. coli, it's, it's product dependent. Right, that was the only question we had. So again, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us and thank you, Rochelle, for the presentation. And everybody have a great rest of your day.